Thank you, Alex. I'm really happy to be here with our um, really wonderful panel today. Um, and I am going to ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. We have uh, Elon Benjamin, John Giwa Amu, and Ru Hao. And so, um, Elon, why don't you start us off? Give us a little background. Sure. Sure thing. Thanks, Claudia. And thanks, everyone, for having us. This is a pretty cool uh, virtual experience we're doing here. Uh, so my name is Elon. Uh, I've been working in interactive media and immersive fiction for the past decade. I created my first interactive series back in 2016. Um, and I've been in love with the art form ever since. Now I actually have my own startup based in Berlin, where we're creating character-driven interactive uh, experiences for audiences, for Gen Z audiences. And next, if I could go to you, John. Uh, my name is John Giwama. I run Good Gate Media. I'm a film producer and more recently an interactive film producer. We made a film called The Complex, um, which was released in March and did quite well for us. And we've made another three uh, interactive uh, films uh, over the lockdown period uh, and are picking up speed with the business. And uh, Ru, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Hello, I'm Ru Rupert Howe. I am director of Stornaway. I've been tinkering with interactive film, well, film and technology and storytelling in various different ways forever and um, found it very hard to play in a lightweight way. So uh, have ended up alongside making all sorts of uh, different types of interactive stories, making a application called stornaway.io which is designed for me to use but also just to kind of let other people play with creating particularly starting with branching narrative interactive stories to to help people map those out and deliver them easily and affordably and openly wonderful well so we have three really i think different and um hopefully complementary perspectives uh and i want to let um our audience know that there will be opportunities for you to weigh in on uh, the direction of our panel. But broadly speaking, we are going to um, talk about the creative side of what each of you does. And then we're going to turn our attention to the kind of the, the business side and the distribution opportunities that are afforded by what each of you has been developing. So John, I'm gonna start with you and ask you what has drawn you to interactive filmmaking since you started your career with sort of more traditional narrative films and can you share some of the lessons you've learned by branching into this medium? Yeah, sure. Um, so really technology was the major barrier to breaking into what this is. Um, I was a big fan of the interactive books when I was a kid. They used to come on selling them in school. I devoured as many as I could. And I never really drew the possibility of joining that gap between what I do as a film producer and what I do as someone who enjoys interactive stories until probably four or five years ago when I met a company who'd already been, who started doing it. Um, and the, I suppose the key creative challenge along the way really has been unwrapping my um, storytelling sensibilities, which have been, you know, honed over over 20 years as a film producer into being an interactive film producer um, and essentially a games maker, which is a, a com not a completely different structure, but it is a it is a pretty different structure. And the main departure is departing away from a convention of linear scripts, uh, and that has been the toughest battle really to to win along the journey of learning. Are there any particular lessons that you learned, maybe the, even the hard way, as you have kind of developed interactive films? Any any kind of pointers or tips or any things that surprised you? Um, we, we were working with one of the writers of The Handmaid's Tale uh, TV series on the first one called The Complex, and that that really kind of broke out for us. Um, we That said, we were developing a script for around two years. I got the script financed. Bandersnatch then came out. And I, you know, very avidly started reading the comment sections of the way that the audiences were reacting to that particular interactive film. And there is loads that is amazing about that film, but the way some of the gaming audience were acting, and this was a key 
difference between what we do in Bandersnatch is that they go out on Netflix, we go out on PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, Steam. We're very firmly in the gaming audience. And a lot of the gamers had quite heavy critique. And what I realized from deconstructing the script I've been developing for two years was I'd fall into a lot of the same holes as... So we had to rip apart the script, having a finance script, um, which w- was, you know, <laughs> I looked at that as potentially quite foolhardy, but um, I kind of had to go with my gut on you know, what, what my perception of it was. And, you know, thank goodness it, it worked out really well. But um, that was that was one of the toughest. I've never had a finance thing before and gone, yeah, let's start again. Let's... <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was a tough decision. Um, and is there anything like uh, just in terms of the kind of mistake you felt you were like in terms of some of the traps you were falling into? How would you characterize those? Uh, the, the main thing really is having consequences to choices. It's a really obvious thing to think about, but having genuine consequences, not like, you know, I turn r- right and a bucket of water falls on my head. Um, I act in a certain way five times to this individual out of the four times, uh, so out of the nine times I can interact with them. And on time five, that has then a macro consequence to the narrative, for example. Um, you know, thinking like a game engine in the same way that we kind of think of when we're building linear scripts as an emotional journey but in a slightly more mechanized way and that yeah the, absorbing that and i'm not you know i'm not saying that we've got it right every time but by a long stretch but absorbing that transitioning away from linear filmmaking um that that was a different way to rewire my brain um yeah that's great that's really helpful um so elon Mm-hmm. You moved away from interactive features. You had a really impressive uh, interactive series, and you are moving towards interactive experiences focused on character. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and what um, what led you there? Yeah, happily. So uh, back in 2016, I was lucky enough to get to create a choose your own adventure murder mystery called Virtual Morality. And the whole premise of that story that that film what or the series was could we come up with interactive moments that would be force the audience to make moral decisions where every choice was was had gravitas similar to what john was just mentioning not making them choices of which cereal to drink uh, but choices that would be really really powerful right and it was a fa- amazing experience and i loved making it and particularly seeing how audiences responded to it particularly in the gaming community uh, thanks to reviews from Let's Players like PewDiePie. Really, we didn't even realize we were making a game back then. We thought we were making you know, an interactive movie, but the audience that embraced it was a gaming audience. So I get exactly what you're talking about there, John. And I think that this, uh, but, I, but I ran into a lot of problems, uh, even despite its success, despite it going viral and everything, I was fundamentally, f- frustrated and what I saw in all the comments was a, a deep frustration in the audience that all the choices, even if they were made to be important, still it always still felt like you were just sort of pushing p- pieces of chess pieces around. So going left or go right, choices ultimately felt empty to me. When you think about a movie, your favorite thing about the movie is not the plot mechanics. It's not how a character gets from point A to point B. Your favorite thing about a movie is the character's journey. That w- that's what I would argue. And so I spent the past decade trying to zoom in and ask myself, how can we make intera- ac- interactive experiences that focus on character? And don't strip away all the agency uh, that from that character, because the minute they become a pawn piece, you don't care about them anymore. They're just disposable. So that's been a bit of the journey. And, and can you tell us in... Um... Can you give us an example of how you've developed characters? I think you might even be able to show us a little something. Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, I'll (laughs) I'll give it a little bit of an intro first. So what we do now is we create, at my company Forefront based in Berlin, we are creating TikTok characters that are real life human beings, uh, actors with scripts written for them who are exist on TikTok and pull audiences into a one-on-one conversational story. So audiences find them on TikTok, then go over to a messaging platform and can text with them, call, uh, text with them, call them, really have an AI-powered emotional engagement with this character. And, and uh, better, better than me explaining how that works, I could show you a, a brief clip of one of our characters, Paige. I'll introduce 
page for a second to you all. So a year ago, I was at a music festival. <laughs> I remember those when I was in this really big crowd and I fell into this girl, literally fell. I poured my entire drink down my shirt. It was super embarrassing. But then she turned around and our eyes met and the whole world froze like a movie. We spent the whole afternoon together and it wasn't until that moment that I'd ever really considered that I might be attracted to women. But then I lost her in the crowd. I never saw her again. And I didn't even know her name. All I remember, she had a knife tattoo that looked kind of like this. So if anyone's seen a girl on TikTok with a tattoo like that, slide into my DMs. <laughs> so, so that's Paige. And as you can see, she's inviting audiences to follow her into a journey that's a romance, right? And uh, uh, a digital romance. And what was so cool is that we had another character on TikTok who was, of course, the long lost love. And without any prompting, audiences connected the two of them within 24 hours. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and so that's the kind of an example of how we do character driven interactive storytelling. Excellent. Um, so uh, going over to you, Rue, um, can you give us some context for how you created Storn Away, what your journey was to get there and what your impetus was? Because I think it, it came from a really specific place. Yeah, I mean, John mentioned the books. I think so many of the people who are in this uh, in this area it started out with those choose your own adventure books and fighting fantasy books. And I keep my favorites here at the side, but it is uh, since I, you know, I, we got very into reading these when I was little and programming adventure games based on them and then started making film and then started tinkering with film from 16 mil onwards into smaller and smaller online and digital things in, you know, pre YouTube and, and all of that sort of converged into different types of interactivity with audiences and with, um, options and, uh, you know, telling interesting narratives but it but like I said earlier it was just it's just very hard and I think one I mean it's really interesting listening to both of you talking about that process of learning um, you know what's uh, what's driving consequence what's driving scripts what you know what people's experiences are and and learning by doing and seeing other people doing things it is there's something about gaming here and there's something about filmmaking here, but it, actually it's these kind of stories, their own, their own thing. And there's a, there's a, a language and a kind of way of handling characters and stories in there, which is, which is quite unique to this. And, and you learn it by doing it, I think. And uh, I got very, you know, I suppose I've spent a lot of time tearing up pieces of paper and post-it notes and putting things on the wall. And, and then I made the very first one of these interactive stories on YouTube, when they released their first kind of interactive annotations, um, which was just me messing around with my phone camera because I was a mobile video blogger at that point, very early on pre iPhones and things like that. And, and uh, realizing, wanting, wanting to get to that point of making it very easy for people to be able to do this so that people can mess around with it experimentally and to try and get away. I spent, I've spent the last 10 years working broadcasters like the BBC and big media companies on uh, translating between technologists and creators uh, who very often speak very different languages and watching huge amounts of money being spent on interactive projects that get built once. You know, all the code gets built once and then it gets thrown away and everybody goes off and does something else and the project, you know, the, the, somebody else decides to do something later on and uses a completely different set of people. And it felt to me like the code base for this stuff that we should be able to use WordPress or Squarespace or you know Adobe-like tools to be able to create these things, and uh, and that was what led to Stornoy.io and just creating something that you could log into on the web, map things out, and play test immediately. And that play testing is really kind of the key part of of getting to that thing that John was talking about, where you've got a story and you need to know that it works, and you watch other people. Uh, experiencing it and get their feedback and actually get to see what works because it things work so differently in 
on script in on the wall when you've got them in your mind when you've got them on paper to how they are when you're actually playing them again people obviously know this really well but as filmmakers we we think we're really good at planning things out and working through to the edit and then you sit down and you know particularly first timers when they're working on this you sit down and actually play something uh, or give it to an audience to play and very often you don't get to do that until the very end with these technologies and bringing that right the way up um, has is really helpful in in working all of that stuff out and having something that you find all of these new ways of telling stories that work uh, for the for this unique kind of pure interactive medium rather than film or for game. And so, Rue, in terms of the audience that Store in a Way might appeal to, like who are the people that you think could benefit, or who are the people you're already working with? I just in terms of just broad categories because it's quite an interesting yeah. range. I find. It's a ridiculous range. We're working from from really high end production companies who are producing for ideas and developing ideas for all of the major SVODs um, and in you know and YouTube originals um, to people you know theatre companies. There's a, one of our first projects that as soon as we launched, you know, we just happened to be at the right time for a theatre company here in Bristol that was making a, a interactive story. Their first thing that they'd done on film in 72 hours, and they'd mapped it out written it in one day, shot it the next day, and then they had to put it together and they were planning to sort of do that on YouTube annotations. But it was a, a night, I mean, a technical nightmare, but they did it in 72 hours and it's torn away. Actually, that last day that would have been a complete technical nightmare, that became easy. And then they got to that part of being able to, to map that out and see how it played. And it's great. It's called uh, Select a Quest and you can see it at selectaquest.co.uk. It's for kids, for, you know, kind of six to 10 year olds. Um, and so that, and, and then we've also, you know, part of what we're proving out because so many things are in development for things that I can't talk about, but the things that we've tried to prove out are, uh, and released are films where we've spent very little amounts of money and spent, tried to turn them around very quickly. We did a film with Terrell Williams, uh, BAFTA Elevate writer and director, you know, that we shot in lockdown in a day with a couple of actors, all everybody in remote locations, us in Bristol, three different locations in London with actors filming on Zoom. That was just a really simple story that he had about an idea of a guy who was turning up hungover to a work meeting. And every time he tried to tell his boss the truth, he got fired. And And the story was about how you as a, as a, as a young, early stage employee and advertising company with a manipulative boss, you know, how you navigate those that relationship and and it was really about watching and replaying and I think that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot with the stories from the big TV companies to people who are doing things for business stuff and training things to to theatre companies is short things that people are watching able to watch and replay and um, and unlocking the joy of being able to see something multiple times and see it from different perspectives and I guess sorry talking a lot very fast but I I think we expected to be doing a lot of drama. Um, and I guess those, those things that I've talked about are that, but actually most of the people that we're working with are working in documentary, factual, um, you know, unpacking reality TV shows where they've uh, shoot a lot of stuff and they have to compress it into a linear timeline. And actually they wanna release all of this stuff that they've shot um, in non-linear ways, all of these little modular scenes or specialist factual wildlife programmers who are you know, who go out and shoot 300 hours for every hour that ends up on TV. I spent a long time working with the Natural History Unit here in Bristol. Um, so much doesn't end up going out there and they have to end up, you know, they spend 15 weeks in the edit choosing a series of different small vignettes about each animal and the animal behavior. It's all accurate animal behavior, but it's a sort of constructed reality. And people are thinking about different ways to present all of the different possibilities that that animal has in a given situation and the ways in which they affect other people in the ecosystem. And people are like telling stories about climate change and the consequences of climate change. That whole thing about emotional resonance and complexity and consequences really, you know, it opens up a new avenue for storytellers to play with. So people shifting out of linear world into this world is really interesting. And they get to they get to kind of iterate and previs with with Stornoway um, mm -hmm. uh, in a kind of creative way without having the, without the technology getting in the way. Very interesting. Um, so we had actually polled the audience about the next question for John, 
And the winner is, uh, what people want to know is, what is the development process with an interactive feature? Can you walk us through that? Um, you know, given it's a completely, what, what I try and keep in mind is it, it's a nascent landscape uh, where I mustn't presume that I know as much as I, as much as I think I do. So what I try and encourage the filmmakers that I work with, uh, who, you know, are generally a, a talented bunch is as much as I work, try and work within conventionally, what I know has succeeded and we have built on in the past. I'm also aware that we're building into a landscape, which is, we're just probably on the first rung of the ladder of the interactive journey of actually developing these things. And there are all sorts of things out there, which I won't be thinking of. So I try not to shackle people in the development process at an early stage. That said, what we do is quite specific and what we know works and we can monetize. So we make interactive films where we take the player on a journey in the body of another actor where you're going to get to the end of that journey, whether you make the right or wrong choices, but well, you're going to get to an end. It won't be necessarily be a nice end, but you'll get to an, an end. So what you won't do is get stuck in a room looking for a key for a door handle that you don't know where it is, which personally I hate that. Um, but <laughs> lots of people really enjoy it in the, in the gaming world. And that's like a puzzle, which some people really enjoy solving. I, I just don't, as a filmmaker, I'm, I'm, what I do tilts more towards a filmic experience, which is I want to be part of that journey and interacting with it, but ultimately I want to be carried on a wave where I know it's heading in a direction. And I, so, so those are the type of stories you make. Now, the complex followed that philosophy behind it. And we've just done a film called Five Dates, which got released yesterday. And it's, it's done pretty well on Steam. It's got like 96% positive reviews on there. And it's, it's, it's done really well. And it's a super simple setup. It's, a, it's an interactive romantic comedy. It's the first one I think that kind of has been out there. There's been dating sims before, but this is like a genuine romantic comedy. It's got comedic elements to it. We've got a great cast. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's done really well. It's a very different structure to the complex. Like when you know the lattice work beneath it, it's an incredibly different structure to it. Um, I think part of the reason it's succeeded is that because we were filming under lockdown conditions under, you know, it's all shot on iPhone. So we shipped the phones out to the actors. They had to do their own DIT work. Um, we had a DIT, uh, working remotely as well. Um, and a DOP and you know costume and uh, and, and uh, slash production designer production manager first ad you know you're kind of a usual but skeletal crew um and you know a bunch of young actors and the the the, the, the structure of that has been that you choose one of five people to go on a date and then maybe you you elevate to the next level so it's much more gamic in its mechanic whereas the complex was much more of a really deliberately designed five act structure, which is much more of a classical feature film, feature film structure with an inciting incident, a three act structure within the middle section, building to a crescendo and a final fifth act. Now that, although it had branches out and what have you, it was much more akin to a feature film narrative, whereas five dates is much more of a game based narrative. Um, uh, so, so I suppose, anyway, this is kind of me learning on the go, really. I suppose to ask what I've learned about the development process is I think you need to get your mechanic sorted out pretty quick. Because if you if you buy into the philosophy of making games, which I do, then you need to understand why the audience is playing and you need to understand the balance between that and the filmic experience that, assuming, you know, there's filmmakers in the audience, what we give it naturally is filmmakers. Okay, well, we can do that bit. You know, assuming that we're, you know, we're filmmakers who do that for a living. So it's, it's learning really what is that mechanic that keeps the fundamental mechanic that is often hinged as a relationship between character and concept. So you've got a concept, any high concept, you know, it's, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a horror narrative or sci-fi, whatever it is, what character is going to perfectly bump up against that concept? So you're constantly providing friction and drama and you know, that is what we're used to solving as linear filmmakers as well. That that dynamic is exactly how, you know, I, I look into developing linear films. So in that respect, it's similar. Um, it's just that gaming mechanic and working that out. And you need to be very clear on that. And just a quick follow-up question to that. When you're in the development process, 
Do you have a kind of a rule of thumb in terms of how many endings are practical to contemplate or how, how, how far away your story can branch and not break the bank? Um, or is it really a, a you know, it's, it's more project based and that decision has to be more organic than that? You know, one of the things I, I've worked on various budgets, you know, 10 million and 100,000, you know, all, all, all the way kind of down. And really it's the riddle as a producer is of course, working out what to give and where to give it in, you know, and what the story kind of needs. Um, so to answer your question, there is no really hard and fast rule for me for that in five dates, which was significantly lower budget than the complex. The complex had, you know, eight endings, really five end endings where you can kind of get to the very end. Whereas five dates, um, has got a lot more than that, although it's a fraction of the budget, but the shooting format allowed for more permutations. Um, mm. and that was a, you know, production practicality to solve really. So we're going to, we're going to, we, we've talked about sort of plot driven narratives. Uh, and now, Ilan, I'm coming to you with a question about uh, the, the, based on the preference of the audience, the creative process of designing characters, which I think is a really good compliment to what John was just talking about in terms of the work you've been doing. How do you plan for what, you know, who these characters are, what happens to them, how much can you control the story? Talk us through it. Yeah, absolutely. So we launched five characters in the past few months. We launched five characters on TikTok and each designed to be as a very simple story that you could describe in one sentence. And that would, and the number one question that we asked when we be designed these characters is, do audiences want to be friends with them? It's not just creating a save the cat moment to use a screenwriting term to make them sympathetic. It's actually asking if audiences, if this fourth wall was completely broken and if they were sitting in a room together, would audiences want to be friends with them? And that's the first question we approached with every character that we designed is how can we make these characters lovable and friendly in a way that we want to spend time with them on a daily basis? Because the whole premise of our company is that interaction is going to be the future where we can interact one-on-one -on -one with these characters, where I can talk to Harry Potter on a daily basis, right? And so we designed each of them by looking at sub-communities within TikTok and seeing what was already very popular. There's these beautiful thriving communities, especially the LGBTQ community on TikTok is just uh, beautiful. And we saw certain kinds of stories really played well there. And so we decided, and, that, and that's how we came up with the characters of Paige and Liv, to tell a story that would really resonate with that audience specifically. And each of our characters was designed with a sub audience on TikTok in mind, because you could be very targeted and you can hack virality pretty simply if you understand the algorithm. The beauty of the algorithm on TikTok is that it sort of is like crowdsourcing virality. If something, if, if audiences love it, it will, it will drive up, it will go up. If it's pure, it's, it's almost like removing the gatekeeper entirely, the studio system, uh, the you know, all these different barriers that have been in the way is removing them and getting directly to the audience. Not to contradict Jason Blum and what he was saying earlier, but we really do allow the data to decide which stories deserve more content. Because we can see very quickly by like to view ratios and follower growth, which of these characters have legs and which of them deserve to have season after season, uh, as opposed to just maybe a 15 episode pilot. And how do you decide, so you, in what you showed us with Paige, like help us understand mm -hmm. a little bit the story elements, obviously character driven, but what's gonna happen to Paige and Liv and how do you control it? Yeah, so Paige and Liv, it's a pretty linear story. Unlike what we're talking about when we talk about branching interactive narratives, that's not what we're doing at Forefront. It's definitely something I, I love and admire, but we're moving away from that because of uh, A, production costs. Uh, you, I bet John and Rue can both tell you that creating a bunch of different branches with a bunch of different endings costs a lot more a lot more to produce at the end of the day. And we're trying to be the scrappiest uh, production company uh, in the world, really. Like we're trying to keep lower our costs as much as possible, which is why converting audiences over to this uh, messaging platform where they can interact with them daily and one-on-one -on -one is really, really uh, to us more about interaction than plot-driven interactivity. So. You might have a conversation with Paige on the messenger and it might be different from anybody else's conversation, right? But the it, 
by the end of that conversation, you will get to the same point. We're still telling very linear stories. What, what we believe is really meaningful is the character's journey to get to that point. How do, so for instance, Paige asks at one point, the audience, yeah. have you ever been through something like this before? Have you ever experienced this? And audiences, 42% of our audiences poured out their hearts, sharing really intimate emotional stories about what had happened to them. So it's almost like, to me, interact, the future of interactivity is holding up a mirror to the audience and asking them to, to be on the same level as these characters. And that's what where Paige's story sort of naturally goes. And as we develop more content for her, a lot of it is based off of what we see the audience asking for and, and, and also sort of following our, our formula, which is a soap opera formula, which is always able to produce more stories, right? Always being able to tell uh, sort of fun, soapy, teen angsty stories for, t for young Gen Z audiences. That's so interesting. Um, so I'm going to, Rue, since you have a bit of a bird's eye view to a lot of different types of uh, interactive content, can you share some lessons learned um, that you like yeah, things I mean, that you've over the years? Really good ones that have just come up there. It just is really, uh, you know, we've covered a lot of those things. I think the, the first one that I always want to jump to is the importance of being able to pre -vis what you're doing. I think I've talked a bit about it already, but whether it is, you know, uh, something immersive or whether it is something that you are stepping through as an interactive story, the ability to be able to keep pre that in a multimedia kind of a way, uh, even with placeholder videos and storyboards or like audio, right from the start all the way through is important. And it feels like it's impossible to do until you build technology, but there are uh, things that let you do it in a string and sell tip kind of way, or with, you know, that's what we built Stornoway.io to, to help do for, for the whole process. And I guess, um, you know, the thing, uh, what Alan was just saying about branching narratives, a lot of the producers that we go into do think that as soon as you start creating a branch, you, 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 you sort of, Inc multiply the cost multiple times and the amount of shooting multiple times and, and what we see with lots of different structures that people are innovating is it doesn't have to be that way you you diverge out a bit and you converge a bit and you know these map well, i started out when i was tiny mapping out these things and you see in these books the structure is you know reasonably it diverges out a bit then it converges to act points it diverges out and converges to act points which i know we've talked about a bit that thing that ilan was talking about with you know, the journey of the characters. You actually, what a producer we were working with who's quite an experienced producer was saying, you know, whenever he talks about working in interactive, people say, oh, that's the thing where you get to choose the ending, where you have lots of endings. And lots of the things we're working on, there are act points which are single act points or single ends where you get to, because it's not really about choosing the ending. Mm -hmm. And again, it depends on what you're, what you're, who you're, who you're producing for and where it's going to be produced for, whether it's a game or audience or a, TV audience or kids or whatever, but it, you know, it's the journey to get there. Uh, uh, Dan Ifigan, we talked to uh, uh, Ardman for a thing that we made in the summer and he had a really nice way of putting it. He said, as well as things working from the start to the end, you have to think about working across it, is the way he described it. You know, you're each, each timeline that you're choosing, each time you're creating a different path, that has to resonate or complement with the other paths. And that way you kind of create this multi-perspective resonance and richness in a story which doesn't have to be too on the nose you don't have to have sort of specific rewards and points and things like that to get at the end because actually when you're watching it again you're like oh it's kind of what we get from episodes when we watch episode two or something and it reveals something about episode one but you're doing this kind of laterally um and the audience are just really smart a lot of the producers we're working with me saying uh, Alex Breen at Nine Story, who we who who we again interviewed for something earlier, we talked about the fact that this is a generation of media makers. It kind of goes to what Alan was saying about characters and delivering TikTok stories for for this generation, for Gen Z. You know, the, I look at my daughters here, and they they're just so familiar with story structure and making things um, that you just they you can't they they're they're much smarter than you think they are as a particularly as older makers um and you can give them a lot of reward and respect them and they'll really play with it um i mean i could go on but i'll pause there for a second take a breath i, I just well th there's something that you and i talked about and um right uh which i just we, wanted you, to you, have you, you 
Well, sorry. I was going to say you have to say because you have or you've made some. You're getting to talk to us, but you've made two massive interactive <laughs> features. Uh, That's fair enough. And you have a lot to say about you know the things like giving the the way of framing choices, which is quite interesting. Uh, well, perhaps in the Q&A. And, and you've been invited, uh, our participants have been invited to ask questions in the Q&A, which we will revisit towards the end of our uh, of our panel. Um, but just real quick follow-up question, which is, um, you told me that the thing that surprised you most is that audiences never experience or play the game the way you think they might. Yeah. Or that there, I there's often a even if you can previs everything, there's a way in which interactivity is harder to predict. Am I am I um, paraphrasing Absolutely. that accurately? No, you, it's really important that you aren't, and uh, Amy Grossberg at Nine Story talked about this, that about their process that they step through um, in creating uh, interactive stories, which is uh, just testing all the time with the audience, because like any digital product, you, you think you know how it works, but you don't know how it works. And you don't know what people are gonna think about it until you get it in front of people. And they will not just break it technically, but they'll just not understand what you're trying to do in the story or something will land differently for them. And and when you get it in front of them, you can't do that in the script. You you know, when you get it in front of them, they you really, you watching people play is just delightful and fascinating. It's a different thing from watching somebody watch uh, play and edit that you, worked on because you're so attached to things. It's like it's like rehearsing or scratch performances in theater, I think. And um, uh, and they, and, and, you know, you're making something for kids, you play it for the kids. They come up with ideas or they come up with expectations that you just can't have as the team. And then you tweak it and you can tweak and tweak and tweak and keep going. Um, if you've pushed all of the technology to the very end, to realizing what it looks like at the very end, which is what a lot of creative producers have had such Trick, tr such a tricky time with immersive, I think, is you know so much terrible technical workflow, and you get to the end and you're like, oh, if I'd known, I would have done it differently. And I think, um, yeah, they, they they will always bring something good and interesting to it. I love the idea of of the character driven stuff that um, you know emerges from um, from what from you know from from people's reactions in real time to it. So um, keeping an eye on the time and knowing that we want to take some questions from the audience, I'm going to pivot us to the um, uh, kind of business side of our conversation, um, because I think it's really interesting to people, how do you monetize what you do? Um, and you've all been <coughs> successful in doing that. Um, so uh, I am going to um, I am going to ask uh, Elon, um, what is the business reality for you of creating these interactive experiences? How are you able to to financially make this viable? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the beauty of what we're doing is that. What you see, what's so cool about TikTok as an emerging platform is that it's still early days. Brands don't know how to monetize it. No one, it's kind of like the wild, wild west, right? People are like, how do we make money off of this thing? And that there's an opportunity there. And so you see some incredible influencers and personalities, who are, some of them who are only 16 years old and within one year becoming multimillionaires. Case in point, Charlie D'Amelio. She was paid $1 million to do a Super Bowl Super Bowl commercial for Sabra Humus, right? So the point being that powerful personalities are, again, they are disrupting the traditional gatekeepers and entertainment and becoming their own, their own content creators, their own studios, their, they have their own companies, their own merchandise. And so each of our characters that we're launching, those who are successful are going to be just like that. They're each going to have their own merch and their own uh, ways to uh, sort of make do brands, brand sponsored content classic sort of model on TikTok, but ultimately the real potential here down the road is, is on the AI platform that we're developing. Where, you know, I worked at Inkit before I moved, uh, when I first moved to Berlin, I worked at a startup called Inkit, and I saw how powerful a mobile app aimed at young female audiences, giving them narrative content, this is immersive fiction, could be. One book that I wrote made a million dollars within six months. And that was just from a group, a small group of whales who were paying over $100 per month to binge more content. 
they loved the content so much that they were willing to pay more for it. And so that really to me is sort of the dream is to create a platform where audiences can come over, talk to our characters, and if they want to talk even more, they can pay for more and sort of create uh, bingeable narrative experiences that incentivize audiences to sort of befriend these characters and pay for bonus content the same way that they're paying for bonus p content on Patreon, on Substack, and other awesome new emerging platforms. That's a really interesting model. I was I was fascinated when you explained it to me. And and just can you give us a sense of like what the numbers are that like what kind of audience um like the numbers are really Im impressive and like the reach of these characters. Can you just give us a sense? Are you comfortable sharing that? Sure. I mean, within three weeks, uh, we posted all of our content within three weeks and we had 33 million views, uh, 6 million likes. But the, the best part was the engagement. Uh, we had engagement between 75 to 250%, which is like by and far way higher than what you see on traditional top TikTokers. Mm -hmm. And the, re the reason for that ultimately is thanks to the content being very hooky, the content being very narrative and cinematic and, and relatable. At the end of the day, we created characters that audiences want to be friends with, that they see themselves in, right? And so they're commenting because they, they're saying, I've been through this, I know what this is like, this is what you should do. And that sort of engagement is what we're proudest of, I would say. Uh, in terms of, um, I mean, in terms of follower amount, we, yeah, we grew to half a million followers within three weeks from zero. So that was pretty cool. That's very impressive. Um, and John, so, what distribution opportunities have you found in the interactive feature space? You've also had really impressive success. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's what's possible and what are you found to be successful? Yeah, we, you know, we're not half as innovative as what we just heard there. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're, we're, a, we're a much more conventional um, business model of distribution. You know, the, the sickening thing about being a linear filmmaker is, you know, I've made, you know, three or four films that have made over, you know, millions of dollars at the box office. And, you know, every time, you know, you look to the distributors for a paycheck, you, you know, you, you get that. And that is a very depressing thing to go through a number of times as a filmmaker. Where you think it's just a rolling hill. If I just make five million, maybe it'll, if I just make seven million, you know, and so I was very much looking at this area with as a very pure view to distribution where we have direct access to the distribution platforms of PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, and Steam. The platforms take a percentage off that, and then the revenues from that are directly dumped into you know a central coffer pot. And that is a very pure revenue stream with a... Um, you know, a lower percentage of publicity and advertising you need to put behind that than in the linear film game. And that just makes more of a, you know, potential sustainable um, existence for a filmmaker. Um, you know, we've, you know, we've done pretty well at, at it. The, the distributor that we launched with first, we, you know, performed 50% better than the next nearest title, you know, week for week revenues. This one that we've just released, you know, is looking like it's going to do pretty well and, um, you know, going to profit quite soon. Um, it's it's a kind of it's a different landscape and i'm bringing obviously a lot of the tricks of the trade that i've you know won over 20 years as a, a successful linear filmmaker uh into an arena where we've partnered with a, a a gaming partner who's a certainly a very specialist in gaming and taught us a lot but also we picked up a lot on, along the way and partnered with good talent um but you know what was just said about the idea of using platforms then like TikTok to symbiotically um maybe amplify that message because we 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 distribute all around the world you know we've got a massive presence in china you know turkey bizarrely is, a, is like a really you know big presence whereas for linear film it wouldn't be america of course a huge audience britain really not so much so and that's where i live um you know it's it's a where the audiences are for this type of content in what we do anyway and and I'm always kind of um, cautious to not sound prescriptive because interactive is such a broad landscape of what interactive is. I'm just like, you know, that much of interactive. There is so much beyond that, that I've got my silo, <laughs> you know, which I'm, you know, keen to keep venturing out of cautiously. Um, nevertheless, I kind of understand my silo where it is right now. 
um, and we're all kind of in those, um, you know, to to an ex to a respect. Um, but anyway, in terms of monetizing it, it's it's you know, as I said, it's it's a pretty simple model in terms of make something good, put it out on a platform that you know gets out to a wide audience, support it with advertising, um, and hopefully you'll get revenues coming in. Mm -hmm. And and Rue, are there any? Um financial opportunities you see in interactive media obviously you know john and elon have very unique or uh, very specific models that they're working within right now what types of um, opportunities have you seen or are you even participating in right now well i think what's what's exciting about it is it's really early days um like it's like it's strange that it's really early days because people have been making interactive stories in so many different ways on so many different platforms forever. But this streaming interactivity, this ability to do both stuff on social, but stuff using the kind of platforms, what I've been waiting for and waiting why we waited until this moment to move to move ahead with Sonoway.io was was having the the uh, the viewers watching stuff on smart TVs, you know, watching high quality TV on smart TVs in the way that we all know that we are, you know, where we our TV was so much lean back. And now we lean forward and we are prompted to watch uh, new videos at the end of every video we watch, you know, we watch the next episode. YouTube is just a sort of giant collection of, uh, of a sort of a giant interactive story. It's a giant collection of, of clips all pasted together with links or adjusted by the algorithm. And there's something, so, so I think there's all of the, all of those existing models suddenly become opened up to be able to, to make stories in interesting ways um and you know netflix have done amazing pioneering work funding some big interactive films like bandersnatch for their main titles they made about 10 of them now um and things like you know they really struggled with the tools early on because the tools didn't exist and now that the tools exist a bit more they've developed their own tool things like the uh, interactive version interactive episode of the unbreakable kimmy schmidt you can feel the writers really playing with their audience and really developing that on in this kind of branching narrative form. And now we're seeing all of the other, uh, you know, SVODs and broadcasters dipping their toes into it and trying to figure it out. The BBC have done some work last year and we you know all, like I say, the high end producers that we're talking to are talking to all of the big platforms about it. And it's somewhere in their pipeline, in their tech pipeline, some are further along than others, trying to figure out how they do it across different platforms. And so for those people, that's about commissioning money. You know, either people come with their own self-funded IP and then the commissioner for the channel or the SVOD puts it out there, or the SVOD pays for that and and they own the IP. And then I guess, you know, the YouTube model, YouTube has interactivity baked into it. So what we're seeing, and you know, YouTube originals are really interested in this space. They've done some stuff in it um, already where that's all ad funded. You know, that's the ad funded model and the kind of the increased engagement that Ilan was talking about. And that is just, amazing for that driving subscribers and um, driving uh, driving ads and driving watch time um, and what what we're trying to do I guess I, I dodged the I tried to dodge the bullet of it even though it's early days by by focusing on creating a tool that works for everything so whatever platform you're delivering to you can what you can deliver to it I guess the, the main thing that I was trying to remember what I've forgotten is is John and you know uh, good gate and Wales interactive model which the direct to consumer selling it as an app selling it as a download game bypassing the gatekeepers that you know from what i've heard of the what, what john just said and what what i've heard from other people about that wales interactive model in terms of the return on investment that's you know there's good prices being sold for uh you know uh, media games being sold for good prices a lot of which goes through to the people who make it and that feels like a there are places like steam like playstation xbox itch.io for indies um, which are really good for just selling something, and you don't, it doesn't have to be massively expensive. Sounds like Five Dates was made on a on a more uh, affordable ROI budget than you know than the, the late shift and and the complex. Um, and that feels exciting. That people it was can just do important stuff. to make something yeah. during COVID, really. Yeah, right. And and get <laughs> stuff that's been so expensive to make previously to turn it around and get it out there, and then find ways behind paywalls or for advertising. You know, some people are doing things for Patreon subscribers, you know, um, and it's just, yeah, it's fun and uh, and playing with people's the, the slight itchy feeling that we all have where we feel like 
we just want to see new types of stories being told with, you know, short form content. Do you know what was exciting about Five Dates at a, is that it broke precedent in terms of what I thought was achievable. So ordinarily as a linear filmmaker, you go into development, what are you going to do? A linear film in a year minimum? Like some films languish around for five years. So you take that as kind of like, I, I developed the complex for two years, then plus another really three months of kind of reworking it, you know, in a very short time frame. Um, five dates, we conceived and developed the script in two and a half months, something like that. Yeah. And it, it's just really interesting that you can do that. You know, I, I, yeah. it's it's just interesting as possible when you when you're forced and when it's like you have to do yeah. it now. You have to. I was I was very much heading towards actors are going to be locked down the same as I am. They're going to want to work. We're going to be able to get a higher level of talent in front of the camera. Let's race towards that point. You know, God knows when this is going to end. You know, it might have ended. There was a certain point where we were told this is all going to end in June. You know, and I was like, okay, great. Oh, we got to go on set for June <laughs> because the actors are all going to be back to work. <laughs> so, you know, they'll want to get paid properly. And um, I suppose, you know, yeah. what I'm getting at in summary is it's when you want to, you can develop these quite quickly. And I was working with someone who was very talented and had done one already. The, 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 even at a zero budget level, you know, the stuff that we've been making that's been grant funded with uh, that, I mean, one that's made on absolutely zero budget, just kind of friends and favors uh, are, you know, with no coding required. So that kind of gets rid of the development cost, but also lots of council funding, you know, local authority funding for a thousand pounds, 1500 pounds, you know, COVID stuff to put together a day's worth of shoot and get something out. That is, it's nice to be able to make, it's just indie games. It's back to that. John Cocteau thing of, you know. Oh, kind of we're paper. hearing hearing somebody outside the outside our panel. Um, so I just want to quickly jump over to a couple of questions from our audience. And then if I have the time, I would love to ask you a question about the future of interactive film. But first, um, we have a question from Caroline Gross. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. For writers who are moving from traditional screenwriting into interactive, what do you consider to be the pivotal collaboration roles for them to work with during the development process, programmers, et cetera? Um, I don't know who feels most comfortable answering this question. In other words, for screenwriters pivoting to interactive, who should they ally themselves? Who should they be working with? Well, Rue, you probably have the most to speak, say about this, but I'll just point out yeah. that to make an interactive film, you don't need to you don't need to be a coder. You know, that, that's the beauty of where we are nowadays with technolo technology that all you need is a camera and a great story and an actor. And there are so many choice, so many opportunities to go out there and to create branching, uh, branching content. Even you could even use Twine at first if you want to simply make a branching story of that. Right? So, but but Rue, I'm sure you have so much more to say on this. I yeah, I mean I I partly made Stornoway.io because a twine because I because because a twine was making my brain explode in the same. Charlie Brooker <laughs> talked about using twine being like doing a Rubik's Cube inside his head when he was trying to make Bandersnatch. So there, but you can definitely, you know, the way that start, everything starts is post-it notes, right? I mean, any linear story. And one of the really f great things that um, my partner, Kate, who, Kate Dimbleby, who I work with, who's come from um, music theater background, she's brought the idea of story islands, just bring scenes, locations, sections of story into, you know, what we call islands, these chunks, which are a post-it note on the wall, but also a section of script. In terms of who you have to work with, I think the the important thing is to think about where you where you want to deliver it to at the end. What we were just talking about in terms of the business model: Are you going to do this on a shoestring and try to get it out there? Is it going to be a downloadable game? In which case, you know, are you are you delivering for a more gamey audience, or are you trying to pitch something to an SBOD? Or you know, that some of the idea about what what who you need to cater to, and then once you start doing that, I think. The important thing is is to be able to uh, push the technical development, as Ilan was saying, as far down the line as possible, and get the people who might be players or audience into the room, so that they to to to, to think about them. Um, your your audience are probably more user more useful than uh, than cr crew and and technical partners at that point. 
and then depending on yeah. your delivery mechanism it's you know you, you deal with those things later on i think that's good advice um okay and one i think we're going to take one last question from tara or tara Ta dodd um, I think I'm going to pose this one to you, John, which is when producing multiple possible endings, do you ever have a favorite ending that you want most people to find? And I wonder if this overlaps with something that you and I talked about, about the kind of moral dimension of interactive film. Oh, I'm not hearing you, John. Maybe other people are. No, I think you're oh, muted. Sorry, um, the, the, the books that Rue showed there, I've got an option on uh, one of the books in that series. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. So, so, I, so we've done. Oh, can everyone else hear that? Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, um, so we're looking to um we've just done a promo with the mandalorian technology on um one of the books in that series basically okay. one of that book that i learned from and i didn't understand as a seven-year-old when i was reading about death trap dungeon which is the name of the book and why when i walked through it i felt like although i was in horrible places with goblins and various people trying to chop my head off and all the stuff that happens in death trap dungeon there was still weirdly a, a kind of almost benevolent force guiding my hand as a, as a very, you know, as a young child yeah. behind it. And that made me feel something. And it made me want to, although it was horrific. Oh, wait, John, you're muted again. Uh, Ru and Elon, can you hear John? No, I can't, no, can't hear him. Sad times. Can't hear you. It was the benevolent force. Yes. I know. The benevolent force, this is his favorite ending right here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Leaving us in suspense. We cannot hear you. Oh no. Oh, John, I'm sorry about this. We're not. Um, since you spoke about it already, Claudio. If you can't get his sound back, is that? I think we're going to have to. Um, well, it, now you can basically imagine multiple endings. You can imagine what John was going to say and make your own interactive version of the ending of this panel. This was all planned. It was all completely intentional. Um, I just want to thank you all for participating. I think we're out of time. Uh, but I think we really touched on through everything you're doing. I think we really touched on sort of the future directions of the interactive medium and how many possibilities there are. Just, um, how we're just beginning to you know, explore the possibilities of the analogy of being on the first rung of the ladder. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today, Elon, John, Rue. Thank you. Thank you for the audience questions. And, um, enjoy so the rest of the conference. Yes, thank, thank you, you everyone.